If you have a Bible, please open that up to Psalm 75. Psalm chapter 75. Well, as you um, gather from my prayer and as you gather from the psalm that we just sang, which, uh, which spoke on this, and from the sermon title itself, we're going to be talking about two different types of people and how the Bible really summarizes that all people in the world fall into one of two categories. Now, what's interesting is, as Shanez mentioned, we're in Psalm 75 today, and we have been making our way slowly through the Psalms every summer, working our way from Psalm 1 all the way through, and, and this is our halfway point. So we are at Psalm 75 out of 150, and what's very interesting, you know, not many people, well, really, no one has figured out. There's been a lot of guesses, but no one has truly figured out how and why the Psalms were arranged the way they were. There's, there, there's five books within the Psalm. There's these divisions, and there's kind of general themes that you could say. It starts with kind of some solemn realities, and it ends with praise, um, but all throughout those categories, you get different types within there. Um, there seems to be chunks that are, you know, by David and then chunks by Asaph. But then within those sections, you get some of David and some of Asaph and some of Solomon and other places. So it's really hard to understand how did they arrange these psalms? What was their, their reason for organizing them into the patterns that they organized them? And, and so, uh, you know, as your pastor, I'm just going to say, I don't know. But I think it is not an accident, whether by those who organize it or by God, I don't think it's an accident that halfway through this book, we're reminded of this truth that there are two types of people in this world. Those who know God and those who don't. Those who the, world, uh, those who the word says are the wicked, those who do not believe, who do not follow the Lord, who do not love him, and those who are the righteous. Not righteous in and of themselves, but those who have been made righteous by faith in the promise of God. And so this morning, we're going to be reminded of this solemn, at times, reality. So if you have your Bible open to Psalm 75, please follow along with me there. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. We rec we recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. This is now God talking. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. Selah. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up. But it is God who executes judgment. Putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed. And he pours it out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off. But the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Would you pray with me again? Lord Jesus, would you be with us now? Give us your Holy Spirit for understanding. Lord, humble us. Humble us and teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I want you to get from this psalm, we just have two main categories here, the wicked and the righteous, as you see from our sermon title. And the main idea is that the wicked will fall and the righteous will be lifted up. We see that in this psalm, this 
idea of lifting up and putting down, this idea of the boastful versus the humble. We have the category of the wicked versus the righteous. And so what we're going to look at first is the wicked. Who are they? What is their end? And then we'll look at the righteous and what is their end. So first, the wicked. And I'm going to be pulling out. This doesn't break down you know, easily into these four verses and then the next whatever, however many. I'm going to be pulling out from within our psalm, so have your Bible open there. But what are some ways that the wicked are described? It says they are boastful. They are arrogant. They are proud. Look at verse 4. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. This idea of lifting yourself up, self-exalting, putting yourself above others, putting yourself first. I've mentioned this before, but all over um, the Midlands, and I don't know if this is like a national campaign or what, but you see these signs popping up. Love yourself first. That's that, what that really is, is it's just making public what's true for all of us in our sinful nature. It's, it's terrible. It's an evil and a wicked truth, but it's true for all of us. We do love ourselves first. That's why God in his word has to tell us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because that's not our natural tendency. And we can't do that because we are born in sin. We are born with a, a tendency to put ourselves before others. Watch out for number one, right? That is our natural inclination to love ourselves before others. So it, it's this self-exalting, this self-love. And then it says, do not lift up your horn. What is that about? Now, I, I, I kind of had to look into this. Is this like a horn you know, of triumph, like victory, when a, an army wins and they blast the horns, and, you know, it's a victory march or something like that. That was pretty good, right? Yeah, I've been practicing that, not really. Um, you, if you want me on the team later, I can add, you know, the horn section. No, I don't think, that maybe that's hinting at that, but actually a horn was symbolic of power. You know, the bull's horns were its it's, it's way of fighting. And to weaken a bull, you cut its horns off. And so the horns of the altar of God, when, they, when God told them to build an altar, he said, put a horn on each corner. This was symbolic of God's power. And one of the things they would do at the sacrifice is they would put blood, they would dip their thumb in blood and put blood on the tip of each of the horns to symbolize God's forgiving power. And so this idea of horns is this idea of power and might, and it's a way of saying we are strong. And so they're lifting up their horns, they're boasting about themselves, and God says, don't, don't lift up your horn on high. Don't walk around with a haughty neck, with some sort of swagger that you think you've got it all together. But instead... Be warned. What does God say? Verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed. This is a picture of, of a fermented drink, a fermented wine, the foam. It's bubbling with fermentation, and it's well mixed. It's got the right ingredients. But who is it that has mixed that cup? Notice who it is. It's the hand of the Lord. God himself is preparing this cup. He is the brewmaster. He is the one who is holding this cup. And what does it say, continuing on? He pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Listen, this is, this is God's word. This is the truth of God's word that God's wrath will be poured out on all of his enemies. I wanted to walk you through a few passages this morning. You know, when we think about this, some people might make the argument, well, 
This is talking about the Old Testament God, right? Before the New Testament, before he showed up as a gracious God who loves sinners and he sent Jesus because he loves, he's not, he's not that type of wrathful God anymore. That's not who he is. Look at Jesus, right? Jesus did not come in to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John three seventeen. But then what does Jesus say? I didn't come to condemn because you're already condemned. Because you don't believe. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, 5 through 10 says this. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed, who? The Lord Jesus? You mean that gentle Savior? That loving, the one who, you know, he's just all love and, and kindness and gentleness. He, you know, he doesn't want anyone to suffer. That Jesus, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. That's New Testament. That's actually one of the last books written in the New Testament. It's the newest of the new. And this is talking about a God of justice and righteous wrath against sinners who do not know him. This should humble us. This should make us think honestly about whether or not we know God. Do I really know this Jesus who, who has come to bear the wrath of God for sins? That's what Jesus was praying about in the garden. Matthew 26 Jesus, in the garden, said to his disciples, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He came to the disciples after that, and he found them sleeping, and he said to the Peter, so could he, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, and here's what he prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. In John 18, a similar um, passage, kind of the parallel passage in John 18, Jesus is in the garden, and when Judas and the, uh, and the enemies of Jesus come to arrest him, they all fall down before him. When he reveals who he is, he says, I am, and they all fall down. And Peter, Peter later, he takes out his sword and he strikes someone, Malchus, trying to take his head off. He misses and gets his ear. Jesus places it back on Malchus, and Jesus turned to Peter and he said, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about what's promised in this psalm and in, in Jer Jeremiah chapter 25, where the Lord says, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. This is the same cup that Jeremiah later in chapter 49 says that I will not let anyone, God says, I will not let anyone go unpunished, but you must drink from the cup. 
Isaiah 51 says, Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. You see, in the Bible, there is a cup that God himself has prepared for the wicked. For those that the Bible says do not know God, those who have not obeyed, not believed the gospel, that God is now preparing a cup, a cup that is full of his wrath, full of his righteous judgment against sin. And in Revelation, we're told that this cup will, in the end, at Jesus' return, will be poured out out revelation 14 9 through 10 says this and another angel a third followed them saying with a loud voice if anyone worship the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand he also will drink the wine of god's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 15, 7 says something similar. And then in chapter 16, again, 17 through 19, we're told that the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great. Babylon is a symbolic meaning, meaning all those who are the enemies of God and God's people. Babylon the great, to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And then in chapter 19, I referred to this last week. 19, we get a picture of, of a rider on a white horse, a rider with the name Faithful and True. That's Jesus. And this rider is coming on his white horse, and this white horse will be stained with the blood of his enemies as he stomps on them and treads out the winepress of God's wrath. Listen, this is the type of sermon that I don't enjoy preaching. But it's necessary because it's in God's word and it's true. And the Bible says anyone who does not place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their forgiveness of sins are counted among the wicked. They are the enemies of God, the haters of God, and the haters of one another. And so this should humble us, as I said, humble us And cause us to say, do I know this Jesus who willingly, Lord, not as I will, but as you will, willingly drank the cup of God's wrath for his people? We just sang, I'll never know the cost of my sin upon that cross. We will never fully understand what Jesus suffered for his people on that cross. Bearing the wrath of God, taking the cup of God's anger and fury and wrath against sin because he is a righteous judge. But the more we understand it, the more, this psalm says, we will rejoice because his grace for his people becomes that much bigger in our eyes when we realize what it is that he has saved us from. And so before we move on, what is God's response to the proud? For those who are self-exalting, lifting themselves up, who are arrogant, he will bring them down low. And that either happens on this earth before his return through the conviction and the breaking down of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of sins, you are brought low under God's 
law. When you're confronted with the reality of your sin, you are brought low, you are humbled, you are convicted, but that's where you must be in order to receive the good news of the gospel. The truth of God's grace for sinners, real sinners, who, who, who Ephesians 2 says are the children of wrath. But God's grace for them is so good that he sent Jesus. And so will you be broken and brought down low before Jesus' return or at Jesus' return? Because you will be brought low. You will be humbled. You will be convicted of sins. If that's never been your experience, pray to God that His Holy Spirit would do the work of conviction in your life to bring you to an understanding of your own sin so that you might get a little bit more of a reality of what it cost Jesus on the cross to pay for it. So that's the first thing from this, that God's wrath will be poured out on the wicked. He will cause them to drink from the cup of his wrath. And that also, because Jesus drank from the cup of God's wrath, this is what we're going to see, see in a second, because Jesus drank from the cup of God's wrath for his people, we are able to drink from the cup of fellowship through faith in him. That's what, that's what communion is really a picture of too. Jesus drank the cup for us of wrath so that we could actually be in fellowship with him. And so let's see what that promise looks like. Let's look at who the righteous are. <clears throat> we see this mostly in the, in the last few verses. Look at verse 9. I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. So he, he's talking about God's anger and wrath against sin. But in that same psalm, he's praising God. He's filled with joy. He's rejoicing. Look at verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God. Really? We're giving thanks to God for his wrath, for his justice. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. We're going to remember what you have done for us and recount them. We're going to tell them to each other again and again and again. We're going to remind each other of the wonderful things that you have done for us. Well, what are the wonderful things that he's done for us? Look at verse 7. It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. We just talked about how he, hum he will humble the wicked. He puts them down. But then he talks about lifting up another. What is that? Well, look at verse 10. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Now notice that last phrase, shall be lifted up. That is what's called a passive verb. What does that mean? It means it's something being done to you. It's not something that you are actively do doing, but it's something that is being done to you or for you. And so what's happening, it says the righteous shall be lifted up. You're not going to lift yourself up by any amount of church attendance, by any amount of good works of service to others, by any amount of good work ethic, by any amount of kindness or generosity. You will not lift yourself up. You must be lifted up by God himself. The righteous are made righteous by grace alone. This is what the Bible says. It's not self-exalting. It's God doing the exalting for us. It's him lifting us up. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. This is Paul writing. Now, Paul, let's just remember his background for a second. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? And, and he said, in terms of the law, I was blameless. So in other words, people would look at Paul and say, according to the law and legalism, he was a good guy right? You get that a lot, right? He's just a good man. He's a good, he's just a good church-going guy. You hear that a lot? Well, that was Paul. He was a good guy, but then look at what Paul says. He says, he says to Titus, who was a young pastor in a place called Crete, 
And Crete was an island of Greece that was known for its brutality, its violence, its evil, its, its just slander, and its trickery. That they actually had a term, Cretans. Those Cretans. And when you called someone a Cretan, that was an offensive term because they were the bad guys. They were bad, bad, bad. You didn't want to be called a Cretan. And Paul is writing to Titus, and he says, Remind the people in the church to be submissive to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. Don't speak evil of the Cretans. <laughs> Why? Avoid quarreling, be gentle, show perfect courtesy towards all people. Be humble towards all people. Don't think of yourself as better than them. Why? For we ourselves, Paul is throwing himself right into this. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. What is Paul saying? What's this good church going guy saying? I am no better than the Cretans. Don't take these two categories of wicked and righteous and say, you know, the wicked are the ones, they're just the really, really, really bad of the bad. But most people generally are good. You'll have pastors and all kinds of people tell you that kind of stuff. Psychologists, that people are basically good. No, they're not. No, I'm not. We are enemies of God. We are wicked we are full of sin, totally depraved, slaves to various passions and pleasures, hating one another and hated by others. That's what Paul says. All of us. That is our tendency, to love ourselves first and to put all others behind us. So what does Paul say? But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not who saved us? He saved us. It was his work. He did it all. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. This isn't anything we worked up in and of ourselves, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice that phrase. In the first point, what did we say God was going to be pouring out on the wicked? He was going to pour out his wrath. But look what he does for those who would believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. He pours out on us richly through Jesus Christ his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, so that, verse 7, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs to the hope of eternal life. Listen, friends, this is the gospel. This is what we say we believe, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they are justified by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. The five solas of the Reformation in the 1500s and 1600s is that we are justified. That term justified is a legal term. It means we are declared righteous before the righteous judge. We are declared righteous. That the righteousness of Jesus that he earned on our behalf is credited to us. It's not anything we did in and of ourselves. It's not any participation of goodness in and of ourselves. But this righteousness is credited to us. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, according to the Bible alone, for the glory of God alone. That he would receive praise, he would receive thanks, he would receive all worship. But if you don't believe that your sin is that bad, then what good is Jesus? If you don't believe that the gap between you and the Father is so great, then what did Jesus even do to bring you to him? If you don't believe that God's wrath against sin is filled with fury 
against his enemies, then what's the big deal of Jesus taking it for us? The truth is, we are sinners, deserving of God's wrath and punishment, that we are counted among the wicked unless we place our faith in Jesus Christ by his grace and God's righteousness is counted to us. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's not by works. It's not by anything that you do. It's purely by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. James 4, 8, 4, 6 says, He gives more grace. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who have been, again, broken in their sin, brought to conviction of their sin, and the consequence of their sin are humbled, and those are the ones who are ready to receive God's grace. The message of forgiveness. So, if that's you, what is our response? It's thanks and praise. This psalm says, we give thanks to you, O God, when we remember these things. So yes, this is a solemn topic, isn't it? But we can still end with worship. Worshiping God for his righteousness, for his just judgment, but also for his grace that saves real sinners. Real sinners. Listen, it is much harder for someone who grew up in church all their life, went to all the Sunday schools, has read their Bible, can spit out theology, it is much harder for them to understand the grace of God than someone who has really, really just screwed up their life and knows it. Who is really just filled with regret and shame for all the things that they've done. Because when you say there's a real God who's full of grace for sinners, who's full of forgiveness, who is ready to forgive if you would just come to him. That there's a real God for real sinners. And he's a good savior. So if you're walking in this church just feeling like a pretty good guy or feeling like a pretty good girl, listen, I pray that God would break you down so that he can lift you up in faith. That's a scary prayer, isn't it? Psalm 139 says, God, show me. Reveal to me where I have gone wrong. Show me my sins. That's a scary prayer. But it's a prayer that God will use to bring you to conviction so that you can see the goodness of a kind Savior who loves, really loves, is a friend and forgives sinners. He forgives the wicked if they would come in repentance to him, if they would humble themselves or be humbled by God. And so this is a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of grace for real sinners. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, forgive us when we don't take these things seriously. Forgive us when we just go through the motions again every Sunday, going through the motions, whether it's because we've been a believer for a while and we've forgotten, we've forgotten the great salvation. Lord, like David says, restore to us the joy of our salvation. Help us to remember how much you have truly done for us because of your love and your forgiveness and your grace. Lord, for those who, who have never been brought low, who have never experienced that conviction of sin, who have never been confronted with the reality of the wrath of God that will be poured out on all sin, 
Lord, humble them. Break them down so that they're ready to receive your grace and the truth of your forgiveness. And Lord, for those of us who, who acknowledge that, who believe, Lord, help us to care about people who don't know this. That the reality of your judgment, the reality of hell, the reality of heaven would fill us with merciful hope and love that others might believe this good news, good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen.